Hi, I'm Noel Kingsbury, and with my colleague Annie Guilfoyle, we run Garden Masterclass, which we started five years ago to do educational workshops for garden and landscape people in the British Isles. Hello, and I'm Annie Guilfoyle. We still do uh, live events, in-person events all over the British Isles and also into Europe, in fact. But since COVID happened globally, uh, we now have a, a, an online programme and we do webinars as well. So we are now a global garden community. All our information packed webinars are recorded and they're available from our website. They're pay to view, but members get a discount. And this is a recording of our weekly public service broadcast that we like to call our Thursday Garden Chat. It goes out at six o'clock on a Thursday live and that's six o'clock UK time. We talk to people from all over the world, designers, gardeners, horticulturalists, nursery people, botanists. Um, and so it's always a great range of people um, and always very exciting. Uh, we've got recordings here on YouTube, but masses more on our website, and our members will have access to even more. In fact, we've got hundreds of hours on our online library. And take a look at our website um, and see what's coming up on our diary pages. Everything is listed in the diary, so webinars, live events, um, everything that we do, it's all in a chronological order, and you can click through to a link to yeah, get in more information or to buy tickets. And you may want to sign up for a monthly uh, newsletter, our, our mailing list, or you might like to become a member. We do these weekly events for free, as indeed do our speakers, but we have costs, which is why we really appreciate donations. And you can make donations from our homepage. Well, we really hope that you enjoy this recording and please come back and try and Last year, I had a very exciting trip. I was teaching at Chanticleer, which is always a wonderful trip. And I know that I, I know Susan Ryan's watching tonight. So um, Susan Ryan and a group of her colleagues asked me to come out to the APLD in Washington um, to do a couple of workshops. And we were based at uh, Heronswood. Uh, which was fantastic. It was my first trip out to the, the wild west of Washington State, really. Um, and um, we had uh, time to go and make some visits. And thanks to Susan Ryan and to Susan Goats, who, who drove me up into the far reaches of Washington State to Port Townsend, because they said, if there's one place you see um, before you die, <laughs> <laughs> one place you see you've got to go to far reaches and it is a long trip and it was worth every single mile so um that's where i met these two amazing people sue millican and kelly dodson and then the, there's a funny little twist here because we've actually been to far reaches um uh, farm on our um thursday garden chat before because just about a year ago maybe a little bit over a year ago we had Kenton Seth and Paul Spriggs do a wonderful talk about crevice gardening. And they were actually working at Far Reaches at the time. And some of you may remember um, that they held the computer up to the window and we could see out the window at this enormous crevice garden. It's like the crevice garden of all crevice gardens, which is at Far Reaches. So I, I came and met Kelly and Sue and the nursery, I, I looked, I just had another quick look at your website. It says a plant collector's paradise. Well, that is an understatement. And also, I, I as I was Googling far reaches, far reaching came up as, as a as a as a, uh, a term. And, and, it, and the definition is has great influence on many people. And I thought, well, that certainly does. So I met you guys and we walked around the nursery. We didn't have a long time to spend there, but we walked around the nursery and Kelly kept saying, holding up a plant and saying, now this is really interesting. And then he'd hold up another one and say, now this is really interesting. And after about 40 minutes, I said, Kelly, they're all really interesting. You can stop saying that. All... <laughs> Shut up, Kelly. <laughs> Shut up, Kelly. They're all really interesting plants. I honestly, it was an absolutely amazing yeah. visit. The nursery is a plantsman's paradise. If anyone's going to the west of um, uh, the states or to Washington State, then it uh, it's a it's a long old drive, but it's worth it. Anyway, it's a long introduction, but I, but I think you guys are very very worthy of it. Welcome. Thank yeah. you so much for for um, for.
for, for giving up your time because it's early in the morning there and I know you should be busy in the nursery um but you're not <laughs> well, no thank you so much and it's cold and windy out so we're happy to be that's here. fine that's fine you're nice yeah. and tucked up inside that's great well it's lovely to see you both and oh it's um, and I, I well welcome and you're going to you're going to show us a presentation which I think explains exactly where you are geographically doesn't it because I yes. was I, yeah, yeah great <clears throat> yes here we are we've got wonderful our first wonderful well yeah, I'm going to I'm going to hand over to you and as usual anybody has any questions please put them in the chat box and we will um be asking questions afterwards but I'll leave it to you guys and I'll just put myself on mute Sounds great. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for the invitation to speak. It's just so great to see you again, Annie. It's uh, uh, we just had so much fun when uh, when you were here. It's like it's just one of those times when you when you meet somebody and it's just so unexpectedly delightful. And right. um, uh, we can hardly wait to come visit you in your on your turf. So that's <laughs> and uh noel it's great to uh meet you virtually i mean you're yeah i, mean, I do just, hope uh, we can meet um live physically one one day but, yes, uh, I hope so. yeah yes, ideally maybe. ideally at your place yeah. yeah we've never been to portugal We'd let's love to let's set a date now shall we <laughs> i love that, that idea great. <laughs> <laughs> well we can talk later on that that'd be great um so yeah so um, as Annie mentioned, we do have a we do have a nursery, Far Reaches Farm. Um, we uh, we're 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 not close to anything. We're two hours from any major metropolitan area. We're two hours from Seattle on a good day, and a good day means the ferries are running on time. The Hood Canal Bridge is not open for uh, marine traffic, and yada yada. So. Um, yeah, we're we're a ways out there, and you have to want to come. Um, and it's difficult with with COVID. We had to uh, we had uh, lost staff, and uh, so we had to close our retail aspect. But uh, we do uh, mail order all over the country. We have not figured out yet how to uh, effectively mail to Canada or the or Europe. Um, so that's unfortunate. Um, but. Um, and we and we do have display gardens, but we are open, you know, by appointment. And uh, um, so, in in twenty and and Sue and I have done, you know, we we love we love unusual plants, and mm -hmm. and we're both kind of students of horticulture, students of botany. Uh, we're not professional botanists by any means, but we are. Um, I think we're probably the most general of generalists because uh, we like everything. We like everything. Uh, we're not keen on aquatics, so at least there's one group of plants that uh, we're not obsessed by. Uh, in 2017, in order to help foster this introduction of plants new to North America that are, you know, perhaps threatened in the wild, perhaps threatened in cultivation. Goodness knows there's a lot of uh, elderly plants people out there with incredible plant collections that are unparalleled anywhere else. And when they go, oftentimes these collections are dispersed and uh, all that attendant information that's uh, stored up and up in the noggin there is, is lost. And uh, so that's an important uh, uh, plant avenue to uh, conserve and introduce. Uh, so 2017, we founded our nonprofit, Far Reaches Botanical Conservancy, and uh, uh, to kind of take over that from the nursery. So uh, we're eventually, I expect everything's going to be all under the one umbrella of uh, of the conservancy. So, uh, but it's it's a growth process, and it's totally uh, at this point totally member. Yeah, member no funded member supported and, and thank you members <laughs> and we've done incredible work i think uh, uh with the support we have from memberships and uh, goodness only knows what we could do with a major endowment hint hint um so uh yeah let's get on with it here because yes, we've got slides as usual, yeah we've got so too many slides as usual so that's what we do let's see how do i do this rolling it i'm rolling it i'm rolling it i can oh there we go uh, yeah. Okay, so here we are. We're in Washington State, as Annie said, and we're we're. Uh, you can use that little. I will. Okay, so we're in the pretty far western part so of the state. So we're right, right there. exactly there. So yeah, yeah. So you can kind of see where Seattle is. That's a frame of reference. This There's is a uh, water between us and Seattle. This is Victoria uh, over in uh, Vancouver Island, British Columbia, and of course Vancouver is just right up here, out of sight. 
And uh, we're in the rain shadow, actually. So even though uh, the, the west side of our Olympic mountains get 100 inches of rain a year, we only get 18. So yeah, so very the, different. Climate. Yeah, the prevailing sort of winds go this way and the and the rain is just scraped out by the mountain range. So we actually have native cactus, the Puntia fragilis, just growing down the street on the bluff over the water. So it's a complicated topography, as, as Annie was saying. We've got these mountain ranges. We've got these lowland uh, rich trough valleys we've got this big range of mountains here that these this elevation is in meters by the way and for Mount Rainier so it's much taller than that right. uh, but then all the rain gets scraped off and it's just desert it's just dry step desert here in the Columbia River Basin so it's it's very complicated uh, and interesting uh, place yeah, to great, live great plant diversity as a result so, you know, because it, it's we're in the rain shadow, it's just always sunny in Port Townsend. And yeah, and we, we have rainbows all the time. And so here's 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 Port Townsend. It's a it's a, you know, a quaint Victorian seaport, actually. Uh, and it's, it's full of characters, too. There's a, a lot of interesting characters in this town. Yeah, Port Townsend was going to be uh, was going to be Seattle, but uh, we they couldn't get the railroads over the over the Olympic Mountains to get get there. So it kind of withered. Uh, but we've got some great Victorian architecture in town as a result. But it's a, uh, but it's very interesting. There's a, it's always been a draw for uh, for alternative lifestyles, and uh, now it's a, a draw for um, you can find an expert, multiple experts in any obscure discipline. I swear. Uh, but uh, one interesting, uh, this is pretty typical of. Uh, gosh, why won't this work? Sure, go ahead. It's working just fine. Uh -huh. you, you've got the magic touch. And, and so uh, this was just as uh, during the uh, Clinton and Trump election a few years ago, and, and she was uh, uh, busking outside of our local organic food co-op. Uh, Your money will help me flee the country when Trump gets elected. And and uh, couldn't help but wonder if, um, you know, maybe Trump's thinking about fleeing the country. It's It's possible right now. Uh, yeah, and uh, so yeah, we've had some pretty famous visitors come by. Uh, so here we are. Here's Annie in our shade garden with S Susan. Uh, we can't quite figure out what you were all looking at. We can't remember, but it must have been something interesting. Yeah, I don't think it was those skinny little maples from uh, from Vietnam, but who knows? Yeah. Um, and um, we've never met Noel in person, but uh, Andrea Jones, we did meet. She came through Port Townsend photographing for this wonderful book. Uh, photographing the drones and um, uh, our Western Red Cedar. So it was just lovely to meet her and we had a great visit with her. Yeah, she and Alistair, uh, her her husband's just a knucklehead and great guy. And, and uh, we've just become very good friends with them. And, and, uh, and sub subsequently we went and visited them and she was in, still in the process of photographing and for the book. And so she said, well, I've got to go to Logan and uh, photograph Polyupus australis if you want to come along. So well, how can you say no to that? You know, Logan's such a place of magic. And uh, this is the uh, champion tree in, in the UK. And uh, we had never seen anything of the like and and just blew us away. So this uh, polylepis is a is an evergreen tree in the rosaceae, the rose family. It's a, there's used to be that there is just a handful of species, but recent uh, uh, genetic work has bump that up to about 45 species now in the Andes, uh, yeah. running from Ecuador, Bolivia, uh, Argentina, uh, Polylepis australis is the farthest south, hence the australis. Probably the hardiest species. Probably the hardiest, it. yeah. Anyway, it had all these props around it, and she said, well, would you mind taking these props out so I can photograph it better? And we were just stunned when they said, sure. And so they removed most of the props, and there she is. It, it was it was like it was like the queen had come yes. when she arrived at Logan. Yeah. I mean, oh my God, they were just falling all over themselves, and uh, yeah. uh, that was just so fun. Yeah, it was oh a great, my gosh, great day. But it really did inspire us to uh, uh, pursue uh, acquiring um, polylepis in uh, Grimshaw and Baton's book, New Tree to Culti Trees to Cultivation. They talked about. How there's just like basically polylepis australis and cultivation and efforts need to be made to introduce this. So, um, we, so we just... had the opportunity to go to Argentina, but here first is where it all began for the two of us. We met in a, on a seed collecting expedition in China in 1997. So 
Seems a long time ago now. I know, and I and, had like a full head of hair. It was so good then. Yeah, so um, so we've done a bunch of trips to Asia since then. And then our most recent trip was actually to Argentina. Here we are standing in front of Polylepsis uh, hieronymi, which is a uh, not very well-known species. At all. Yeah, and, only found very in a very localized area. And this was at the very top of our plants that we wanted to see on this trip. This was in the spring of uh, 2020. COVID was ramping up here. Virtually, it uh, was not even a bit of conversation about it in Argentina in early May, March that time. Yeah. And so it's like, yeah, let's get the hell out of here and uh, and uh, be able to find find this. It's such an elegant, beautiful shrub. Yeah, it's in the same group as Lanata, so it's a it's, uh, lovely kind of fuzzy foliage. And, you know, this foliage shows its affinity to rosaceae. If you think of like some of the uh, potentillas, for example, that have the same sort of leaf structure and hairiness and the underside with that indumentum, oh my gosh, it doesn't have flowers of note whatsoever. It's just uh, um, really a reduced little business parts it's, it's dangling on for, a string. Mainly for its bark. It's got, they all have that beautiful peeling bark. And some of these trees were very old. Yeah, the botanical literature just says they're just small shrubs, but given enough time and age and uh, lack of human interference, uh, yeah, they definitely do become uh, do become trees. But that thing is ancient. So we did uh, we did travel with Cody Hinchliff, who's on our board. He has a doctorate in botany, and so he was interested in doing uh, herbarium specimens, and here he's doing that with our guide, who's also a botanist. Yeah, and so this is a, a joint sort of botanical trip uh, through one of the universities in Cordoba and. Uh, Seba, who is the, the botanist there, is actually doing research on, on polylepis, and he had not seen polylepis hieronymi, so this was this was really excellent and uh, uh, for him, and he's he's gone back now, but I'm sure, to collect seeds because he was so excited. And so here's our shade garden. Uh, Annie should have talked about that. We showed a picture of her in it, but um, we bought a property that has had no trees, so we decided to create a shade room which and... is kind of strange for people who love shade gardening <laughs> to not have any shade well it was just a piece of property that was available and it was a, it was a good in a lot of other ways so here's our, our shade garden uh our original shade garden getting quite full and one of our favorite plants that uh, that gets about this tall every year Manthum molaraceum from India. And, and one of the great things about having to create this uh, quite large garden room is that uh, with because we don't have trees, we don't have root competition. And so, you know, I think if we had trees, this plant might be half as tall, perhaps, but right. with uh, absolutely no competition and uh, and mulched in a good rich compost. Uh, um, yeah, that's that's a, that's that might be the best plant we own. So now we have um, all these uh, collections we would like to plan out as part of our conservancy collection. So we, we have a need to create another shade garden. So here's here here's the beginning stages of that. Yeah, and uh, and this is just our, our our builder who built this whole thing himself. It's yeah. just I, I have no idea how he did it, but uh, he did. And he's our age. <laughs> <laughs> he's our age. He's stronger than we are. And uh, there's the the finished sides. Yeah, um, it looks it looks rather new with the wood, but I think the wood will weather nicely. And and we've used shade cloth in the past, but it just rips up too much in our windy climate. Yeah, eventually it decays and degrades. And um, yeah. anyway, but this is a um, <clears throat> this is a, a a planter box that's probably seventy five feet long, two feet wide two feet deep, and we're going to uh, be planting uh, out uh, display and evaluation collections of uh, a couple of genera, along with uh, various lilies, uh, uh, facing east, so it's a, a good half daylight, but our Roscoia collection is quite large. Uh, we, If we took like one row of flats and put <laughs> them side by side, we'd be pushing 300 feet long of Roscoe is so yeah some of them are, are our own crosses that we've made and then we've also been lucky enough to um, come over to to your side of the water and get some named cultivars yeah this is a uh, uh, Robin White's a uh, uh, really wonderful hybrid uh, royal purple and we've used that in some breeding to uh, produce this and and this one uh, this is that fabled red Gurkha the or the Roscoia purpurea former rubra, but uh, what's important about this one is this is a, a little piece that we've propagated from a bit that John Grimshaw gave us that's a division from the original introduction of the plant from Nepal. So that's totally 
that just lights us up. And this is one of our hybrids here, the Family Jewels series, which do have jewel tone flowers. Yeah, you can't really catch it in, in the photos, but there, there, there is a definite iridescence to them. And just a few view uh, varieties from from the UK. Yeah, you have so much more than yeah. we do. Uh, this is yeah, uh, people in this country don't really know about Ruscoias, so we're trying to change that. Yeah, this is some of Hugh Nunn's. Uh, this is one of Hugh Nunn's hybrids here, and this is also from the UK. But we don't. Uh, this is brought over by a friend of ours, and uh, uh, Roscoe humiana. That's so great. The humiana is such a good species. Uh, big, bigger flowers than any in the genus, I think, and and they're displayed well above the developing foliage. And uh, this particular one flowers weeks before the other ones do. So pretty awesome. Uh, another one uh, that we uh, brought in from the UK, as well as uh, uh, this uh, distinct one with that nice pink pseudo stem and those lavender pink flowers. And then just getting more into the pink, uh, uh, a yeah, cute so little one. Yeah, unusual color in that one. And and I love the pure white. We've had a number of different ones of mm. those. Yeah, uh, snowy owl is maybe the best best white flowered Roscoe out there. And then um, we had an opportunity to get a queue a few years ago, quite a few years ago now, probably 20 years ago. No, no, it wasn't that long. No, I think it was. No, it was 2023. Oh, 10 years ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. 10 years ago. Don't date us, honey. <laughs> Uh, anyway, we wanted to see the original Roscoia collection that they had there. Yeah, so Jill Cowley did a monograph on Roscoia, which is just kind of a Bible for us. And so we wanted to see the reference plants that she used at Q to, uh, you know, make baser descriptions of on the book. And and we were particularly curious about seeing Roscoia wardii because it's in the, you know, it gets around. A few specialty people have it in the U.S., but they're all wrong. They're all Humiana, and we wanted the real thing, see what that was. And uh, so that was really a treat to see Roscoia wardii, and then to uh, later get uh, Roscoia wardii. I think we got this from Neil at Heartside Nursery. And then also the Asiatic gentians have always been um, wonderful for us. We love them and we we have done some wild collections of them as well as collecting some different cultivars from, again, from the UK. Yeah, you guys grow a lot more of them than we do. Yeah, and so uh, and so the gentians are going to go into that same planter box as the Roscoe is, and they're just going to be a, a great uh, um, August and October uh, display of flowers. This is a, a local one. This comes from Oregon, from our friends at uh, Wild Ginger Farm, one of their selections. Uh, anything, when you see anything with a silk after it in the Asiatic gentians, they're, uh, they're awesome plants. They're uh, all coming out of Aberconway as a nursery in Wales. Their, their hybridization, uh, so good. Yeah, uh, shot awesome silk, them. Yeah. big flowers, floriferous. Okay, so what what else do we do on these seed collection trips of ours? Um, we're also looking for uh, target genera uh, because we have we work with botanists that are working on on different genus, and this is a polygonatum. Yeah, and this is one that uh, uh, Aaron Floden, who's the world expert on on polygonatums, he is doing his doctoral work on the genus. And uh, when he heard we were going going to China he said, and this particular area, he said, "If you," uh, and he sent us a, an herbarium uh, photo of, of this plant, only known from herbarium specimens, dried dried piece of the plant on a on a sheet of paper. Um, he says, "If you can find Polygonatum ginsiensi," he says, I, "I really need that for my uh, for my work." And, and it just so happened we were in the same region, um, exactly the same area, and then on a new trail, and we started walking down the trail and looked down and spotted this. We literally said, let's go find that polygonatum, you know. And there it was. And uh, here it is in the nursery in bloom, and it does smell very strongly of uh, baby powder, so this would also be a good one to put in your lecture uh, for scent sometime, Annie. It's, it's just sort of an overwhelming baby powder smell. It's interesting. And what do we, how about the local, uh, the native flora? We do find some interesting variants of our, our local flora as well. Yeah, and Prostartes is our native Marybells. It used to be Dysporum, yeah. but now it's been broken out from the... Uh, the North American ones. Yeah, right? the North American ones have been broken away from the uh, um, Asian Dysporums, which, which makes sense because the Asian Dysporums, you know, sometimes horticulturally, you can see differences that botanists don't. And uh, horticulturally, you can root stem cuttings of Asian dysparums, but you can't prosartes. Uh, 
Which is really unfortunate. Which, yeah, because there's no way to propagate this other than by division. That's really frustrating and least slow. So, and we're scared to do it, honestly. So a friend of ours found this one and the next one just, just growing in the wild. And we were always very jealous of this until... Until we found one that yeah. we th we think might even trump his a little bit. Oh, well, I shouldn't Can't use, use that, that word. word, sorry. Um, <laughs> might even top his a bit. Uh, this is over east of the mountains, uh, in yeah. the Wenatchee Mountains, actually, but in the right next to a, a, a gravel pit that was an active expanding so, gravel pit. Yeah, that, so. that area may is likely not even there. It's been a few years. So we brought out a little brought back a piece of it and there it is in our garden looking lovely. Yeah and this holds its color all right until October, you know, into October. So it's it's just undimmed by the by the season. Yeah, and our old dog, Callie, who passed away a year ago, um, loved to lay under it. And it was just a wonderful thing that she did not because it would throw all these seedlings um, and then she'd make a nest and dig up the seedlings. And so this would the seedlings from this, we were hoping they'd be variegated, but they're not. They're either all green or they're all yellow. Well, an all yellow plant with good vigor, which these have uh, of that size would be pretty much OK and really exciting and so every time she'd make a nest under that it's like oh good dog that just cost us like three hundred dollars so but we couldn't help but name it after her because here it is so yeah that's that's uh that's, so yeah it's a, good, yeah, it's a beautiful yeah, so we're, we're, we're quite pleased with that actually yeah. And um, also during COVID, we didn't, we could not uh, go abroad, so we went to our local woods, and this is um, just a, a crested form of our our native polypodium, uh, the licorice fern. Yeah, and I'm, and I, I think we forgot to mention on our Argentina trip that we're talking about, we, you know, it was very disappointing because we had collecting permits oh, yeah. as well as collecting right. permits for the national parks. How cool is that? Mm -hmm. And we only had three and a half days in the field before. COVID ramped up to such an extent in Argentina that they were closing the border in two days time and quarantining tourists yeah, so for we 14 days. We so. got the last flight out of Argentina after only three and a half days. It was like mission impossible getting to the airport, honestly, and yeah. going around police roadblocks. That was great fun. Yes. Not. Um, and but, another another form of our uh, a native fern, which I think was perhaps introduced from in the UK, because you guys are also much better at ferns than we are. But yeah, and this is a native for you as well, the Blechnum or Struthiopterus now, Spicant. Uh, but this this one's so good. I just like Blechnum better. Jeez, well, there's native. yeah, no, it makes sense, I guess. Uh -huh. <laughs> and uh, you know, we we have been avoiding ferns for years just because it's a whole nother region uh, overwhelming amount of plants to fall into but now we're doing it so and so we tend to tend to gravitate towards ferns that are like not typical you right. know ferny ferns, ferns. That don't really look like ferns and so you know epiphytic ferns are really interesting and the drying areas in particular have uh, have grabbed us because uh, they love growing on trees or rocks and uh, uh you can see them growing on this uh, rough bark of this lithocarpus and this is in a highly degraded area that tree is not there anymore i'm sure uh, but really neat. It tends to they hold the old fronds, and uh, I have a theory that those old fronds form a function of catching leaf litter and debris from the tree above, which slowly decomposes and then feeds the fern itself on the trunk. Um, so this is in China. Um, see, you're so good at that. Like, roll it. I know. I, I guess I got off the screen. Um, and so, yeah. So it just does retain the old old leaves for years and years and years. Uh, and this this is in Vietnam, another drain area doing the same thing. Yeah, they're just really interesting. We're trying to start a spore program here and we've had some luck with these guys. Yeah, and it, chances are this this fern is no longer there either because this was actually being, this it was a tiny little ridge and it was being actively deforested as yeah. we were there. We were passing yeah. people carrying- There's been a lot of places where we've been in Asia where mountaintops are just being raised for various reasons. So there, are, but here's some sporlings. So that's exciting. Yeah, yeah that's great. And begonias are another one that um, we've been working with quite a bit. Um, the begonias sales went went crazy up during COVID. I think people were buying them because they can also you can use them as an indoor plant as well as a, a plant in your garden. And yeah, so this is in the wild in southeast Yunnan. Right. A beautiful, beautiful thing in the fall. And and here are the young plants uh, at the nursery. Uh, beautiful color and that beautiful underside. Just everything about it is good. It has been hardy in a Seattle garden with just like a 
inch and a half of bark mulch on top during the coldest part of the winters. So that's very encouraging. Um, and sometimes, you know, you, you just get into plants because you're reading a book and you see a particularly enchanting color plate. So this is a peonies of Greece uh, and this color plate of Parnassica haunted me for 30 years. And it's like, <laughs> God dang, how am I ever going to get this thing? And, and we finally found a source in Europe for some seeds. And this is the first flower on it. And oh my God, it yeah. did not disappoint. It's lovely. Um, so, you know, this is a very limited distribution in Greece. Um, you know, certainly, uh, you know, threatened by, you know, the ubiquitous goats and various other factors. But uh, what a beautiful plant. And uh, we hope to get that uh, propagated up and distributed around. Um, likewise, uh, Peonia sauri. Um, this was only described as a new species in 2004, native to northern Greece and into Al Albania. Uh, but what a beauty that is. So Yeah, I can't um, really decide which one I like better. They're so, uh, so beautiful. Yeah. And we love lilies. And um, unfortunately, we love Namakaris. Unfortunately, they've grouped Namakaris into lily now. But they're um, still Namakaris to us. Yeah, I'm just going to call them Namakaris. I'm sorry. Because we collect Namakaris. And how can we do that if it doesn't yeah. exist anymore? Right. So, but uh, yeah, so this is, you know, this is a seed from a, another uh, a plant collector. This is Bjorn Arolsen, an extraordinary uh, Norwegian collector who uh, lived in uh, China for, for many years. And uh, so that was really, really great. So uh, uh, Lilium celii now, and there it is. Beautiful, beautiful thing. And these flat open face flowers are so typical of uh, Namakaris or Lilium, that group of lilies now. And we've been lusting after this species for a long time. Um, and this is uh, just bloomed a couple of years ago. This And the seeds were generously shared by Jim Sutherland, um, who's now deceased, but from Ardfern Nursery in Scotland. Yeah, it was it was it was wonderful to. Uh, um, is he deceased? I think so. OK, <laughs> we'd Maybe. better we'd better check on that. Sorry, Jim, if you're not. Pretty um, sure. But you live anyway. Uh, but yeah, we had a wonderful day. He just took us all around and showed us uh, basically how to run a nursery properly, That's which right. was great. And these are some of our uh, lilies from uh, Vietnam, Lulim Planii, which gets very tall and quite statuesque. Uh, fairly new introduction, you know, in the last 15, 20 years, probably. And a related uh, species often grown in nearby association is Lilium primulinum. Uh, this can get quite tall. Uh, we've had it like nine feet tall in the uh, in the uh, in the shade garden. Oftentimes you'll see it under its old name Majoensi. Right. But just that backside really showing that great recurved uh, tepals to it. And who's who doesn't like cardiocrinums? Uh, a lot of us grow them and they're just just wonderful. And we've collected as many different seed sources of those as we can. As well as as well as collecting them in the wild as seed when we can, and so right. we've we've kind of decided that if you get enough different genetics together of, of of a of a species, you know, then then things happen that are unexpected and interesting, and uh, you get really great uh, seedlings coming up, including this pink one, yeah, uh, which is uh, pretty much unknown in cardiocrinum. So this is, as far as we know, the only. Uh, the the original first pink cardiocrinum. We had two different ones that bloomed pink, so that was exciting. Yeah, and it's a disappointing. You know, cardiocrinums make a ton of seeds. Uh, probably less than one percent of those seeds come out pink, and so you know yeah, the first seeds from this particular one, unfortunately. Yeah, but, but they usually have good color, at least. Yeah, it's it's. I mean, so it doesn't. So it's not pink. I mean, and you end up with one of these. How disappointing is that? Not very, really. So, and we were on the hunt for a, another species of cardiocrinum that's uh, not really known in cultivation, uh, cardiocrinum cathayanum. <clears throat> so this is from China, and we were hopeful, but you know you have to wait five to seven years before they bloom. So this is the first year they just look like grass blades. Yeah, and and we've done a a fair bit of uh, a sharing of some of our our cardiocrinums uh, seed with uh, um, uh, Phil Bolt at Red Hall in in Scotland, who uh, with the National Collection of Cardiocrinum, and he told us that he reckoned there is only two cathayanums in the world. And they're both at Wisley. Uh, couldn't find any evidence of it, it being in cultivation anywhere. But we're hopeful because this is sort of the right color, but it could, it could be a different cardiocrinum at this point. We're not sure. And of course, you know, they take years to bloom from seed. So it's, uh, yeah. So 
And so when it finally uh, did get up to flowering size, it's it's just matching everything that's right. Yeah, we just right. Took, we took the floor of China Key and went through it, and, and it, it matched perfectly to Cafe A. &M. And this is just kind of our our growing beds. They're not, you know, our our gardens. We don't let people see them, hence the weeds. But uh, <laughs> the the leaves clustered here in the middle part of the stem is diagnostic of both Cafe A and Cordatum. Uh, and so that's that's really positive, but there is a distinction between Cathayanum and Cordatum. Cordatum's not in China, but who knows, you know, maybe it could jump over it because it's pretty close. Uh, Korea and Japan, Sakhalin Islands, but uh, Cathayanum differs in having a, uh, um, well, we'll get to it. This little guy up here, this bract that uh, encloses the flower bud, dries and remains persistent at flowering on Cathayanum. So that's quite intriguing. There it is. There it oh, is. that's so good. I love that. So we knew we had the right thing. And so that's been fun to have that. And uh, we've been able to offer it the last couple yeah, of years, yeah. along with this one, which is a really rare form of uh, cardiogranum cordatum, the red form. Out of, out of Japan. And the first time it bloomed, you know, it's like, I was just so lucky that I was color coordinated. Yeah, you generally are, Kelly. Yeah, I work at it, you know. And another group of plants that... Um, <laughs> Kelly would hold this up and say, here's another interesting plant. But uh, <laughs> anyway, um, the podophyllums, the Chinese may apples, you know, this or is Dysosma, if, you, uh, if you want. But um, there, this is just an array of hybrids here. And then this is the, the fabled starfish, which is a type of deformity. Yeah, and here it is flowering under one of Blethen and uh, Sue Wen Jones's uh, first first uh, collections uh, from, I think, maybe their first plant hunting trip to uh, Taiwan right. back in 90-something or other seed. But we got seed through uh, Chris Chadwell, who was selling uh, selling some of their seed for him. So that's right. uh, a rhododendron pseudochrysanthem there blooming. And, yeah, it's, it's pretty hard to beat that foliage, but we, we were trying to use the deformity um, in our breeding. And this is actually a wild collection of ours. So, and it's different from other deformies that we've seen. And that's one of uh, uh, Bjorn R. Olson's and Aaron Floden's collection of uh, this podophyllum. Uh, still work to be done taxonomically. It's just too confusing. There's too many of them that don't fit neatly into uh, various species. Yeah. And we don't know what this species is. Aaron uh, has not been able to figure out what it is yet. So but yeah. but quite cool. But so what do you do when you have all these photofilms yet and you have to hybridize them? So. so sex in the garden, you know, I mean, what a great excuse for for going out. Oh, I've got to go to work and hybridize. So um, anyway, but and that's really what we're doing, you know, so we've got our paintbrushes loaded up with pollen from different ones. And we're and this is photofilm plantum, an exceptionally vigorous form of it called the giant. And we're trying to Trying, trying to get try, some some height into the 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 more uh, trying to get some color on tall stems. Right, exactly. Yeah, you so there we go. Yeah. So yeah, it's it's fun. I mean, you got to have fun at the nursery business, otherwise it's just all work, right? And so we have gotten some great seedlings out of all of our different crosses. Just uh, yeah, and it goes on and on, yeah. and we have a really hard time selling any of these because they're so good. Yeah, we haven't sold any of them. Yeah. <laughs> But we're, we're trying them. to propagate them, so hopefully in the future. Yeah, so if you ever ever come here and, and we take you through the greenhouses um, and, and you ask, is this for sale? No. Is this for sale? No. I mean, we might as well start with no. Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah. they're all stock plants, you know, it's, it's uh, so important. So on to, uh, on to something uh, hotter and drier. And so here's yet another one of those pesky rainbows right on our crevice garden that uh, Kenton, Seth, and Paul Spriggs have done for us. And uh, there's the one, uh, first the one that they- The original one from 2019. Yeah, which we are still working on. We still have to fill those vertical uh, crevices, but we have to find matching rock. We're really fussy. So, um, and this rock will not work in tiny little slivers that we need. So, but we love it. This was the most exciting. We have the most fun with this over anything we do. You can get a higher diversity and quantity of plants in a small space and just about any other form of, of gardening. And, and so it's a place to um, plant some of these plants that are threatened in alpine zones, um, but will actually do well down here at sea level because it's a long, cool root run and then their tops are out in the sun and they're it can stay dry and it looks beautiful even with the snow on it. 
And so we just planted, you know, we planted a wide variety of things in there just to see see how they would do. What can we get away with? Well, Edrianthus, you know, that's pretty bulletproof, but it's okay, a beautiful bullet. Uh, you know, it's a beautiful, beautiful little alpine, and that looks like it could actually be in the wild there in the crevice garden. And this is one that our uh, our friend Cody, our uh, botanist on the board of the FRBC, collected down in the mountains of Southern California, Monardella nana. And here it is in bud. And this is a little creeping perennial mint. Uh, drought tolerant as all get out. And when it opens, it's just this beautiful little starburst. So that's, and that's increased nicely. It's come through our worst winters. We've been down to 10 degrees Fahrenheit here. So uh, yeah, it's a good, good, good plant. And the penstemons have done really well, uh, some of them too well, but this is a, a particularly nice uh, species that, that takes to the crevice very well. Yeah, and it's a native. It's a native to our Cascade Mountains here, and it's a, it's a really a good one. And uh, when we were visiting Aberconway Nursery, we uh, we picked this selection up uh, from, from Tim there, and, and they're, they're saying that it's a, a penstemon rupicola, and it's a very vigorous plant. I think it's very a hybrid. Uh, yeah. Probably it's got some Davidsonianum in it. Um, but um, yeah, it's a, it's a great, great plant. So we're really pleased to have that. And we love Townsend. Oh, Games. so much. Yeah, and they seem to be, they're hard to grow in just in the open garden, but they seem to do quite well in the I premise. Mean, I mean, they're tiny. bloom right now. Tiny little plants. I mean, we've got one, the cushion on it. Where's, where's the camera? There it is. <laughs> the, the cushion's only like that big. And there's like 10 flowers, purple flowers on it that are like acolescent. There are just no stems to the flower, just sitting in that tight little bun. Oh, God, it just makes you melt looking at the, something like that. So, And uh, this plant, uh, uh, which has been erroneous in seed, seed uh, lists for years, I think, is uh, being a different linaria. But this is the true linaria alpina. Or at least a very compact form of it. Yeah. I mean, we've seen it. We it's, saw it growing at the base of the Eiger, actually, when we were walking through a part of Switzerland and just collected a couple little seeds, and one of them germinated, and here it is. Yay. It's taken very well to our crevice garden. And certainly, you know, that's sorely threatened in Switzerland because, you know, it's relying on glacial meltwater, right. and and those are, uh, those are uh, almost a thing of the past. So um, there you go. And this is another little goodie we picked up at Haber Conway. It's kind of funny to uh, to buy a New Zealand alpine clematis in Wales and then bring it to America and grow it in Port Townsend. But it's, you know, this is just perhaps that little cushion of foliage is an inch and a inch, maybe an inch and a half high. And then those flowers are another two inches high. And it's just such a glorious little little bun for a clematis. And some of the cactus have done very well, again, because they've got that nice mm -hmm. dry crown. Yeah, and just looking at this Escobaria, you know, and that, those dense white, white uh, glockids, those spines, uh, you'd think, well, that's going to rot in our, in our rains and our, our dampness over the winter, but not a bit, not a bit. And this is in the Wenatchee Mountains. This is Lewisiopsis tweedii, surely one of the greatest of the rock garden plants that you can grow. It's just a it's almost, it's right on the border of just being too much, but it's just perfect. And uh, reputed- Here it is in, the, in the crevice garden and just getting ready to bloom right now, actually outside. Yeah, reputedly hard to grow, but uh, uh, seems to adapt quite well for us. So we're just over on a, a neighboring island of Whidbey Island, just looking at our Olympics, um, just a nice shot looking into the Olympic mountains. And and this is what we did during COVID. We went hiking in our own mountain range, which is not such a bad thing. Here's a, here's a, um, this is endemic to the Olympic mountains. Yeah, the Olympic rock mat, Petrophytum hendersonii. But here we are hiking up in the mountains. And so it's not not such a bad thing to be able to go just hiking here locally. Yeah, and this is one of our favorite favorite areas. It's a, it's in the rain shadow. It's 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 high. It's a, it's tundra alpine area. And this uh, uh campanula is one of the best things ever. This is campanula piper eye. Yeah, so this is endemic to the Olympics, yeah. only found there. Beautiful and, and different color forms and, and different petal shapes. It's just a wonderful thing, always growing and just basically like rock cracks. Even if you see it in a scree, it's basically coming out of an underlying rock crack. Yeah, I always have to visit this particular rock because my favorite 
plant, individual plant of that is growing on top of that rock boulder there. Yeah, this is just an isolated big, big, uh, big rock. Yeah, and so there it is. I mean, there's no soil there. It's just growing in. The, so it's just right along here yeah. and right along here in these cracks and kind of uh, the ultimate kind of seemingly of coming out of solid rock. And the thing is, is up on this peak, you know, what, what happens is uh, early in, in, in the morning, it, it's wreathed in, in, in clouds. So it's, it's basically scraping condensation from the clouds and that condensation is running down the rock and getting into those cracks. And that's what sustains this here. And the other reason we like uh, coming up here is because we can look just right over here and we can see the nursery and just see about. if everything's going to yeah. form. So not quite. <laughs> it's it's over there. But, but yeah, what, there a, what a beauty. It's just lovely. And uh, another one, uh, uh, Sue and I bonded in China in 1997 over <laughs> this little plant called Arenaria. And we were standing on this high, high pass and it was cold and the plants were dormant and and there's this dry, brown, prickly bun. And and I said, boy, I love Arenaria. And and you said, I do, too. <laughs> and, and we're probably the only two that. And, do, and, so. and you said, I could never sell them, though, at my nursery. And I said, no, I can't sell them at my nursery either. So it's like, oh, what are the chances? We got to stay together. But anyway, this used to be an arid area, and then in 2017, uh, it was changed to basaltica. So it's an endemic to an, an endemic to the mountains. And here's Sue and the dogs up looking for this thing because this is its habitat. And there it is, just the tiniest little jewel you'll ever hope to find. Yeah, perfect little cushion plant. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And so we're already seeing drought stress on these plants in the Olympics, and that's part of the. Part of the whole thing with the conservancy is there's been a couple of scientific studies that uh, we're very familiar with, one from USDA and one from a, a local university, examining uh, the effects on the alpine tundra plants of the Olympics. And basically, there will be no alpine tundra. The alpine tundra of the Olympics will re be reduced to 1% of its total range in like 50 years. And so these have nowhere to go. They'll be done. And we're already seeing drought stress on Sabulina basaltica. So that's that's very disturbing. So we're Yeah, so we're trying trying to um try some of them in the crevice garden, see how they do and see and if we can provide a refugia for them. A refugia. And it's not we don't want to be the refugia. We want to get these distributed to right. where they will will do, you know, Tromsko maybe, uh, you know, gardens and skilled growers, you know, not only professional botanic gardens but public garden private gardeners as well uh, yeah so here i am looking at two of my favorite olympic mountain endemics uh, the campanula piper eye that we mentioned before and also this little violet viola fledi which yeah. is just a lovely thing yeah those two growing together again the violet only grows in rock cracks never in soil yeah, and you can is. see it right here on the side yeah. of, of this uh, uh yeah so good viola fledi so we were able to collect some seeds of that a few years ago um, at the, the day that they ripened, probably. They ripened very fast. And here they are planted in our crevice garden, and they made it through a heat dome that we had where it was extremely hot for us. Um, and they came through just fine, and they're kind of, it's a north-facing crevice here. Yeah, days and de uh, several days of 107 degrees, which is un un night. <laughs> yeah, terrible for us, yeah, you know, so, really but... Bad. 40 years we had we had no damage to any plants mm -hmm. in the crevice garden so we're so excited by that but this is up on a, a kind of a dry step area in eastern washington and and sue's uh photographing this trifolium at the base of her feet this yes, is at the wild horse wind farm really yeah. amazing clover trifolium macrocephalum yeah the, is in this habitat as the name suggests it is indeed a big-headed clover yep but just a little thing, you know, it's just just hunkered down close to the ground to uh, minimize evapotranspiration from the ceaseless wind. But what a what a beautiful flower. But and so, it, you know, we collected some seed and then trying to grow that seed, you know, we kept waiting for it to get like like a real leaf and it took forever. And when it finally did get a tiny real leaf, OK, it's time to transplant that little seedling and its nice little little root system to the crevice garden. Well, and, so this is just a great example of what crevice gardens need, because this is the root on this thing. 12 inches long. Yeah, so. I mean, there's no way to plant that without damaging it, which 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 we did beautifully because it uh, disappeared and it hasn't come up again. But we have a couple other ones planted <laughs> out. We're hopeful they'll come back. So anyway, so 
So uh, we wanted to expand this crevice garden because it's just been such an amazing thing. And so we did almost exactly a year ago, as Annie was mentioning, because Kenton and Paul were here giving a Thursday garden chat. But here it is. Um, and uh, just in, in process, this is the original one. Yeah. yeah. So it's it's much bigger than it was before. Yeah, we got bigger rock and more of it. Um, and here's the guys. This is uh, Ty Danilchuk. That's Chris Dixon. Uh, or, um, that's no, that's Ken Sess. That's Chris Dixon. And there's there's Paul Spriggs up there. Uh, well deserved beers after yes, this was finally it was calling it good. Done. Yeah. Yep. So we've got a lot of chinking to do still, but um, but we have this uh, amazing, amazing tapestry of rocks, which we would never get tired of looking at. Oh man, even just without a plant in it, you know, it yeah. still uh, it still qualifies as art and our. Uh, it's just such a they did such a beautiful beautiful job it's just impeccable so um yeah oh yeah and and just you know the skill they took in lining each course of rocks up with a compass you know so everything's consistent all that detail of all the various faces being the same angle uh incredible and just incredible and it's it's providing habitat for not just plants too our, our little local frogs like to hang out in these cool crevices and uh, terriers like to take advantage of the warmth. She's she's from Texas and gets cold very very easily. So any little like one degree of reflected heat, she she's on it. Um, and we'll just uh, finally end with our long long time uh, hiking companion of fifteen years, uh, who passed away a year ago December. And this is uh, Callie up in a alpine meadow of polymonium uh, on the Tull Canyon uh, upper Tull Canyon in the Olympics. And we'll stop there. Yeah, because Kelly's going to get choked up here. Anyway, yeah, yes. you've got you've got me weeping now. You uh -huh. oh, um, such well, a good I, dog. Absolutely fantastic. I, I've good. got I've got whatever the reverse of homesickness is. It's like uh, you know, I, <laughs> I want to be back there. What, we, want, we want you here. Yes. <laughs> What an back. amazing presentation. Yeah, Absolutely. We, we, we told Andy Sturgeon when he comes back that we'd take him for a hike up in the mountains. So. I know, I know. Well, I'm going to I'm going to get inside his case, I think, and come with him. Um, <laughs> that, um, that, that, that was I, I mean, that wonderful presentation because it, it really is. I mean, it's almost as good as being there. Being there is you know and that's what i mean about you know every everything kelly walked past you go this is really interesting <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. i have to say well, with, we... your, with your roscoia um uh, ob obsession let's call it an obsession um have you ever encountered hester ford in cork in ireland because I think you've probably met your match with a Roscoe. Uh, oh, I love that idea. No. Oh, you know, yes. We, good I think good, good climate it. for them, I think. Yeah, and I think you might have met he, your match. Keith has got some amazing ones as well. Keith White. Oh, Keith has. Yes, he has. Yeah, we need, yeah, to, yeah. We need yeah. to hook up with And of course, with him, they naturalize. Yeah, yeah. 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 Well, 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 one, one question for you both. You made a couple of efforts to collecting permits. I mean, yeah. how, um, uh, how many countries are now demanding those? How e easy are they to get? And the whole kind of bureaucracy around collecting has certainly gotten worse over the years. Well, how is oh. your assessment of that? Oh, yeah, it's, it certainly has. Every year it gets incredibly much more difficult. And, um, you know, I think in, in some respects it's because, uh, you know, I think you you put a program in place and people that uh, manage, the, and I'm just being a cynic here, but yeah. people that manage those programs, you know, there needs to be a certain level of job justification and yeah, yeah, yeah. moving that program forward by making it more and more complex every year to show that you've done something. And I think yes, some of yes. that is happening, yeah. and, but some of it certainly is is justified. But um, yeah, it, it it is difficult. And that was a big driving factor why we did found the conservancy is to yeah. um you know ha we have a nonprofit that's now the sole uh, arm of our plant importation and collecting uh, efforts and any plants that we uh, conservancy plants are sold through the nursery website the nursery donates use of its website <laughs> platform mail order platform to distribute these uh, conservancy yeah. plants and 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 to take that uh, for profit stigma away from that mm -hmm. which i think countries get uh kind of uh, yeah. upset yes. about that yes. we're yes. making money off their genetic resources yeah. um yes. we donate genetic we donate they're totally failing to conserve yeah 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 and so we're so we donate half the half the price 
uh, the farm donates half the, the nursery donates half the price of the sale of each conservancy plant back to the conservancy. So basically mm -hmm. the farm, you know, and it costs more than that to do the growing and shipping and everything. And so, mm -hmm. uh, so we're, you know, there's no profit being made on, on those yeah, plants. And, and, and that, uh, you feel that's actually helps you get more accepted by. It's yeah, a, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, good. absolutely. And, yeah. And we've had that. We've had the good fortune on on all of our, uh, our 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 collecting trips. I mean, our first one was with Kunming Botanic Garden in '97. But mm -hmm. our subsequent trips, um, we've had the good fortune to be able to travel with the Rhododendron Species Botanic Garden. So oh, right. being yes. able to go with the Botanic Garden is is really ideal. Yeah, uh, we yeah. hope to do hope to do. Uh, you know, I'm sure we'll do more of that with other botanic gardens. Yes. Uh, yes. But we've got a very good relationship with with the RSBG, mm -hmm. and yeah. and we've got a good relationship with other botanic gardens in in the states because we do distribute a lot of plants to various yes. botanic yeah. gardens, and mm -hmm. um, and we're very pleased that uh, I think the when, number. I, I think when you were here, Annie, last fall, we were loading up our van to take. Uh, you were you were yeah, heading was yeah absolutely packed full of plants, and we were headed down to California to distribute mm -hmm. plants to you. You uh, were. A whole bunch of different botanic gardens, actually. Yeah, and yeah. so you know, and of, of course, we have plant import permits from the USDA, seed import per permits. We prefer to collect seed whenever possible because it's so much easier. And we're very yeah. careful. You know, we have a list of plants with us that are are pro prohibited. We don't collect anything that's on that list, and we're just mm -hmm. we're very careful to be and so not if, collect anything that looks like it has invasive yeah. potential. Yeah, and so and anything we anything we collect, your seed, plants, whatever, you know, we can't bring it back home on our person on the airplane. Um, we ship it right to USDA. It all has to go right yeah. to USDA, and they, you yeah. know, make sure that they all have appropriate permits and mm -hmm. accompanying them, and yada yada yada. And it's just a, you know, it takes days. I mean, I, God, I hate bare rooting plants and getting. <laughs> yes. The hardest yeah. thing, actually, you know, is not so much that. It's like if you're in a foreign country where they're, you know, in a, in some, you know, where there's no country, yes. spoken, and you and you're trying to arrange, you know. Uh, out of shipping. shipping yeah it's yes, like yes, you know yes. you just walk away from that going god i hope i hope uh, it, not sure where this box of plants is it gets going. there <laughs> yeah yeah yes so anyway yeah. Mm. Yeah. Um, you say you say you have a not-for-profit i mean how how is that set up in terms of you know continuing legacy i mean do you have other, other people involved on on, on, a, on a board I and mean, how is it constituted yes yeah, yeah we so have a board. We, we have a board We're, it's a small board but it's growing and yeah. um, you know covid you know we founded this in late 2017 yes. and uh, then covid hit which just kind of you know put a little cramp in things for us but now we're up and and we've got uh we've got the even though it's a small board it's a very dynamic board and we're moving yeah. forward uh, i think pretty fast and it's totally uh member funded and so we rely solely on uh, membership and donations yeah. um yeah. You know, um, certainly need a uh, we need like an the big endowment. like the big we do need an endowment. Um, Don't we all? You know, most most of the most of the gardens and collections that we truly admire in the nonprofit world yeah. started out being endowed and then developed the collection or right. or preserved the collection, like the Miller Botanic Garden in Seattle, yeah. which is a fantastic garden. You know, that's uh, thanks to the foresight and generosity of Betty Miller to, <clears throat> yeah. uh, uh, to do that. So. Um, so it's still in its infancy, but um, yeah. we're making good good strides, and we're Great, hoping fantastic, yeah, yeah, wonderful you know, enterprise. Got, well done, brilliant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we just just yeah. look at the many thousands of plants we have that are really nowhere else, and it's like well, it's, they they need to be saved. You know, they need yeah. to be yes, yes. beyond yeah. beyond us because we're we're getting up there. Right. <laughs> You're <laughs> heading off to so you've got a couple of trips planned. You're heading off to check to lecture in and when it when is that happening well we're not really lecturing i mean we're going to the comp the international rock garden conference and they've just asked us to do uh 20 minutes on basically the, uh, what we're what the what conservancy is all about and the crevice garden and yeah. the conservation aspect of it of yeah. crevice gardening yeah. here at, at the yeah. at far reaches so we're lecturing just enough to make it a little bit you know nerve-wracking yeah. <laughs> but Absolutely. not, not <laughs> Not, yeah. And and when when is that that is that in May? When is it coming when, right up? Yeah, early May. Yeah. Okay. And then you've got a trip. Have you got a trip to China planned as well? Did you say? When, or... We don't at at oh, this no. point. You know, honestly, with uh, with the uh, U.S. relations with China, I'm yeah. 
you know, I, I would I would I always wonder about becoming the like the Brittany Griner of uh, of the plant world. You know, I, I wouldn't want that. No, yeah. uh, being detained weirdly, um, yeah. Yeah, no, for whatever reason. But no, we are we're going to go to uh, Sikkim actually. Just uh, oh, that's right. Yeah, just on a just looking at plants um, yeah. with uh, with Harry on. So that'll be that'll be fantastic. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, looking and learning. Uh, there's. Mm -hmm. Uh, we're anxious to see uh, there's a couple of species of Roscoia, at least in that area, and we're well, anxious to see that. We're but... almost always there in the fall, so yeah. see something in bloom in the spring or the, the summertime, the alpines will be just yeah. fabulous. So. Yeah, we've only done that once, so yeah. so yeah. Uh, we're, we're so yeah. we can hardly wait. Wish it yeah. was tomorrow, honestly. Uh, right. So are you heading uh, after the after the Czech Republic? You're going straight on. Oh, you know, no, 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 no. Yeah. no. That's not till June that we're doing. Oh, the other okay, thing. okay, yeah, yeah. No, yeah. No, yeah. It's a late, late June. It's a busy time here, so we'll just be gone for a week to. Yeah, the yeah, yeah. Fantastic, yeah. fantastic. Well, oh. it's been it's been wonderful, wonderful having you on, mm. and a very exciting to get a glimpse back to the nursery, and can't wait to come back and see <laughs> you. And actually, um, Lois very kindly, Lois Moss in in the chat box also mentioned lots of other places to see in in the area i mean it's all relative isn't it because it's oh. you know there's there's oh, yeah. uh, dan hinckley's garden and um and uh where else you put shane chandler's nursery and blowdell reserve and i mean you know that area there is so much to see there's there? but, you, but you do need time to get from a to b you know you know you are right. yeah yeah it's just a little little under an hour to get to dan's dan's garden from us so you know yeah. it's like yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you listen, know. I know you've got a busy day ahead of you and work to do, and we're all going to go off and have a gin and tonic and put our feet up. So, well, you know, we might, oh. we might too. <laughs> <laughs> Just join you. Take the rest of the day off. Yeah. Oh, well, we, but, we're, we feel so yeah, honored. Thank you very much. Thank you. That was great. That was great. Oh, well, no, we feel honored. It's been, it's been great. And, and there's lots of lovely comments in the comment box, which I will send to you on, in, oh, on, in an email. Thank you. And, um, Look, look forward to seeing that crevice garden of yours fill up and and uh you know go from strength to strength it's so beautiful congratulations well, looking forward seeing you both in person someday not yeah. too long lovely yeah. okay. okay well thank listen you thank much. you thanks so much you guys and thanks everyone for tuning in and see you soon okay bye, -bye. <laughs> bye. Thank you. Thank bye. You. thanks bye